My name is Tiara Rubo. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist with an emphasis on film, installation, uh, bio art, and digital art. Um, and uh, also, as Kathy mentioned, I have founded um, and run an art space called Babe Lab. It's a little tricky to pronounce. Uh, the fours are pronounced as A's. Um, and it's a space for underrepresented artists, uh, specifically from around the Bay Area, but also uh, around the continent to come and showcase work. We also give workshops. Uh, it's a community space for people to really gather as well as a platform for them to experiment and show works um, across uh, the mediums of, of new media, uh, but also performance-based works and uh, just really to, to create a sense of belonging. Um, so as an artist organizer, um, I, I create this space. I also have co-founded co Refresh with Kathy, which has been an amazing experience. Um, and in terms of my personal work, I just wanted to share uh, four different projects that really kind of highlight the interconnectedness of, of ourselves to other species, as well as kind of get into uh, the, the themes of the, um, of the conference and, and, you know, a little bit of the, the Ruderal kind of seeps into all of these works. Um, so I work within a very hybrid space between a few different mediums, and I hope that you'll find the connective tissue between all of them. Um, my first work that I'm presenting is called Santa Visions. It's a body of work that has spent two to three years of research, um, different iterations of installation. Uh, it, there's a short film component, which I'll show you a, a brief excerpt from. Um, and it explores speculative mutualisms uh, with cyanobacteria in an age of climate collapse, really aiming to reposition uh, the framing of other species, in this case, cyanobacteria, and our connection to them or interconnectedness with them uh, as they were the first species uh, or the first organisms on earth to photosynthesize, thus creating the oxygen in the environment and the atmosphere as we know it today and spawning all sorts of biodiverse life thereafter, including us as humans. Um, now we're seeing kind of like in the cyclical nature of things, human generating the toxins, uh, kind of pollutants that flow into streams, estuaries, uh, and coasts that that really make them really grow and flourish in in these ways that you know they only existed in early Earth. So we're seeing these toxic aggregations of cyanobacteria that are harmful to um, both humans and other species. Um, and at this time. Um, it's again, we're, we're not only creating these algal blooms, but also um, other, other forms of life through um, synthetic biology, genetic engineering and artificial life. Um, but Sayana Visions really posits potentials for biological hybridities and scientific kind of, uh, the, the bridging of science, science to more kind of like indigenous knowledge that recognize the inextricable relationships of human lifespans to other organisms. Um, so I'll play a short excerpt from the film and uh, we'll continue to discuss after.
So that was just a quick excerpt. Um, and those of you who are scientists know that um, <laughs> it was really kind of like a, you know, a more of a speculative laboratory um, that kind of looked at more kind of performative uh, um, ways of breaking out of kind of like the more sterile environment of the lab. I, um, I actually got really interested in cyanobacteria and just the growing of um, biomatter uh, because uh, I worked uh, for a year as a lab tech in Kona uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii and uh, grew, uh, it, was, it was a different microalgae, but grew um, algae to convert to biodiesel um, that started in these like small Erlenmeyer flasks as you're seeing in this picture and that over a week they'd grow to raceway pond. So I was just really fascinated with how fast life could grow. Um, and kind of, it just got me really thinking about how, um, how to kind of like nurture a different species for, and, and watch it, watch it kind of proliferate, uh, you know, and then have that in turn, potentially be something that could be, you know, sustainable energy. This was in 2007, 2008. Um, so um, I think that is what kind of seeded the idea for this project 10 years later. Um, and it has been shown as a single channel video um, alongside different strains of cyanobacteria growing in these sort of photobioreactors that audience or visitors could look at under the microscope. Um, uh, to look at the different forms, um, I've grown different uh, species in the gallery setting uh, that are magnified, sonified as well to kind of just have this kind of kinship with them, although they are in a controlled setting. So the kinship is questionable, but it was really to show kind of the beauty of their forms and to again, reposition um, our idea of um, you know uh, how we can how we can nurture how how we can nurture different life and how that kind of connects back to us. Um, so these are just sort of the different iterations of the work. Um, and it and if you have a chance uh, later on, I have a fifteen minute version of the film that shows kind of that breaks out of the laboratory, goes into nature, and shows uh, humans kind of living. Um, um, just quickly to go back to this earlier slide, like kind of growing cyanobacteria on their bodies. Uh, um, and then the, the kind of like oxygen that is being produced, it helps them to breathe kind of in, in a time of um, when the air is not so fresh. So uh, that's cyanovisions. Um, moving on to a second project. Um, I have a practice that also spends a few years where I uh, create bioplastics, um, not on a manufacturing scale, uh, but more as a provocation of really thinking about our material relationships uh, and our kind of consumptive uh, uh, habits that we have and really repositioning um, ways that we engage with materials. So uh, as, one of the things that has come out of this practice, I created this website that's called the Bioplastic Cookbook for Ritual Healing from Petrochemical Landscapes. And this was uh, part of the web residency at uh, Academy Schloss Solitude in ZKM. And through it, you could navigate through different protocols about how to create uh, very kind of basic types of bioplastics in a home kitchen or gorilla kitchen. Um, and I've, I show kind of like different samples that I've created over time. And again, um, none of these can really, you know, survive in the rain. They're not meant to last forever, but it really is to emphasize the process of creation, creating materials um, and the, the care that's embedded in materials when you make them, shifting our kind of, um, again, our, 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 concepts of time and labor that we, we don't often put into uh, the materials we consume. So uh, bioplastics you have to heat uh, in a solution, mix, kind of like watch to make sure it doesn't kind of overcook, so to speak. You can, and then you have to pour them into a type of mold and what, you know, it could take days for them to dry depending on how the thickness of it, if you're not doing it in kind of like a hyper manufacturing setting, if you're doing them in your home. And for me, it really, it really, again, kind of 
made me think about uh, the ways in which uh, there, there can be this care embedded into the materials you make and it can be a non-extractive process. So you know, the plastics industry uh, kind of, it's, it's connected to the petrochemical industry and we're so far removed from it that we forget kind of the, the harm that it's doing and that it is um, part of the extractive scene as Prabhu Pilar uh, has termed um, this age we're living in. So what are other ways of making materials and engaging with materials that we can be involved in that have a more regenerative cyclical process uh, after these materials are used? Um, if they break, you can, you can reheat them and, and, and create another form of, of bioplastics with them essentially, um, or they can biodegrade and go into the earth without harm. I also like to think about, uh, you know, speculative ways of um, thinking about, could we grow, you know, these biotextiles on our skin? Uh, the fashion industry is incredibly wasteful. It's one of the, you know, there's, when clothing doesn't sell, it often gets burned. So, um, and, and there are very exploitative and extractive processes as well. So having the shift to think about textiles um, as bioplastics, is it possible to have uh, these kind of biodegradable, um, you know, uh, fabrics or textiles that can be used in the fashion industry? Um, I think it, it would be an amazing transition, especially, you know, if fashion is related to planned obsolescence, well, here you go, um, they, they biodegrade over time. I uh, haven't made really any practical clothing, but I like to drape and consider ways in which uh, these, these, these materials can be used in this sense. So I, again, the practice is really to urge others to, to also kind of create. Uh, and with the website, uh, all of the, the kind of protocols and recipes are online. So the best thing that can come that comes out of my practice is people who have DM'd me, which happens often, and they're like, look at what I made <laughs> with your recipe. And it could be an object, it could just be kind of like a small sample. And that just brings me joy because it's people all over the world who are creating and, and, and reconsidering uh, ways in which to make, whether it's art objects, whether it's um, you know just experiments, but it, it kind of trickles out. And I think the idea is for um, these, the um, the concepts to really trickle out. And we are seeing, you know, material shifts in um, kind of products in, in supermarkets and everything. Um, so I've made sculptural objects with them. This was at our Loves Are Not Only Human exhibition uh, in Stuttgart, Germany, which is also connected to Academy Schloss Solitude. And yeah, I, I just really have fun kind of molding and shaping the materials. Um, and I think I, I can go a lot further with them. And, and these are just really still the beginnings of experiments with them. Um, but, but the goal is really not for me to, to be like this grand artist that makes bioplastic art. Again, it's about the outsourcing of information or the dissemination of information into the world and kind of this global movement of, of others making these materials. And, and it's really exciting to see. Um, related to uh, material consumption, uh, I have this project that really connects back to my heritage as Kanaka Maoli, uh, which is Native Hawaiian. And it looks at plastiglomerate, which was first defined and discovered by geologist Patricia Kokorin and sculptor Kelly Yaz back in 2012 on Camilo Beach in Ka'u the south, south point of Hawaii Island. Um, and the heat from bonfires uh, on the beaches or kind of like, you know, melted together littered plastic debris with sand and rock and lava rock to create these uh, conglomerates. And this is kind of different trash that has uh, come ashore from the, you know, the, the great Pacific gyre of trash that kind of just floats in the ocean. And then, I mean, those are mostly microplastics, but these are global plastics that show up as well um, on the shores of uh, Ka'u. And again, like when this was discovered, you know, it, it was 
it was interesting because geologists were really excited. They're like, oh, look, it's a marker for the Anthropocene. Um, and the, the plastic glomerate forms were extracted and then shown as kind of art objects. And it was, it was kind of an unsettling thing that happened because there was no really exchange uh, with the native Hawaiian people as to what, what this means and, and what this, you know, there was no sort of like um, conversation that was had. And for me, the very first thing when I found out about Plastic Glomer was uh, I immediately thought of Pele Honomea, who is the volcanic deity, the living entity that is related to the lava rock um, on Hawaii Island. She lives in Kilauea, the active volcano and Hale Ma'uma'u crater, but really all of the lava on the island are extensions of her body. And as Kanaka, we look to Pele as our ancestor. So really she is an extension of us and uh, the lava and the land are really uh, extensions of our bodies as well. So, you know, from the, the Kanaka pr perspective, plastic glomerate is kind of seen as this invasion um, or desecration almost of, of the land and her, her body or our body with these and the melding of these toxic uh, colonial and petrochemical substances uh, with, with, with the body of Pele. So um, I created a, to this kind of immersive installation uh, at a really contested site, actually. It was at the Ho Hawaiian Mission Houses, which was the first sort of like Western style building that was built on the Hawaiian Islands. And again, it's where they ran the missions, right? It's where they kind of like uh, forced Hawaiians to convert to a Christian spirituality. So it's where um, spirituality began to disintegrate in a sense. So um, there was an ex exhibition called Contact uh, that invited uh, 20 different, 20 or more different native Hawaiian artists to show work and kind of think about spirituality in the context of modern day uh, as well as for, as contact and, and the implications that came after. So I created this piece that um, had, was a two channel installation that showed both the flows of, of lava, um, different, um, different ways of the flows. And then uh, this, in, this LIDAR data that kind of floated through um, Hale Ma'uma'u crater and the different craters of Kilauea since um, Again, as, as kind of an extension of technocolonialism, there's this satellite monitoring that happens, or there's a whole like viewing station at Kilauea Summit. Um, and there's, you know, the in, with INSAR and technology, they kind of actively shoot lasers on the land to detect surface deformations, um, which can also be kind of seen as invasion. Um, and so the, the two channel video really aims to juxtapose these, um, Kind of two different belief systems. Uh, the the lava footage uh, also is accompanied by different ole or chants um, that honor Pele. So uh, this can be seen in an online gallery at New York City. And uh, as a physical installation, I also uh, wrapped different lava rocks with bioplastics. Um, these are from Oahu, not not the Big Island, um, but it's it's all <laughs> the same source uh, essentially and um, I reckon bioplastics is kind of like a hookupu or, or an offering to really think about again different different ways that, that we can produce materials that won't invade um, or um, cause harm to the land um, and I think it's important as we consider new ways of being collaborating with matter and materials uh, within systems that really need to be dismantled. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a reminder that also indigenous people should really be included in the conversation when it comes to in different environmental delegations. And as we're seeing kind of like technology evolve, um, think of reconsider the fact that uh, indigenous practice of indigenous practice as technologies. Um, and just that conversations need to happen that didn't happen, such as when the, the kind of the geological monitoring station was built. Um, conversations are 
not happening enough? Do we need a 30 meter telescope in addition to the 13 telescopes that already are on Mauna Avakea? Uh, and the answer is no, if it's not serving a mutualistic goal with the people and the land. And it's something that really needs to be remembered. Um, so um, moving on to kind of a last project that uh, is, is a little bit of a step <laughs> away from uh, what these other projects are, but still kind of thinks about uh, geographies and mean and, and stories um, embedded in those geographies is this collaborative project called Kai Hai, which is a hybrid of ocean in Olelo Hawaii and Mandarin. Uh, and it's a series of virtual and augmented reality sculptures that really kind of look to trans-Pacific stories uh, from Polynesia to East Asia, as well as uh, indigenous and immigrant stories, uh, diasporic stories related to the Pacific Ocean. And this is a collaboration with Chen Chen Yi, uh, who is from Wangzhou, and uh, I'm, I'm from Honolulu. And we really kind of got to talking about our, it was really, you know, during the last year and a half, we were really missing home. And we're like, what, what can we do to create almost trans-Pacific portals that will connect us to our home? And the first one I thought of was uh, to, to pay homage to uh, Hina Upuhala Ko'a, which is this, the Hawaiian goddess of coral reefs. So we created this sculpture inspired by her. Um, and it exists as an augmented reality filter that you can actually pull up anywhere in the world. Should we first spawned her near Kaimana Beach uh, in Honolulu? And I can play a short video of kind of how that looks animated. So um, it, it's on Chin Chin's IG, which is just 44IAN on Instagram. And when you spawn her, she just can kind of grow. Uh, and I like imagining her again as this reminder that, uh, you know, the, the coral reefs are really affected by uh, human, human, uh, the, a human impact, <laughs> like that we really, um, you know, sunscreens that when we go in the water, like uh, the toxins from them can really harm corals, um, any runoff. Uh, and these are very sensitive and very, um, very delicate kind of mutualism that goes on with the zooxanthellae that are being expelled and we're seeing with the bleaching of corals. So we also made this face filter that's really playful and thinks about, again, how our interconnection uh, to different species. Uh, so, you know, it's playful, but it, it's hopefully provocative as well in terms of remembering our kinship with other species. Um, so the second sculpture we made, we were really thinking about the trans-Pacific cables, the submarine cables that connect uh, pretty much the world <laughs> to allow the internet to kind of all of our streaming technologies, our, our emails, you know, where they run through this huge infrastructure that runs on the surface of the ocean. And it often goes unseen. And uh, one of the first cables was actually laid and connected to Hawaii. Uh, and, you know, growing up on the internet, it's not something I thought about, but as an adult learned about, and I was like, oh, that's, that's, that's how that happened. So we wanted to think of a deity that kind of, a god X that, that was spawned from these trans-Pacific cables. So we kind of created different iterations of them and uh, visualized them in this way. And uh, currently uh, uh, we're calling it AAG or AUG, which stands for the Asia America Gateway, which is one that runs from California through Hawaii to Hong Kong, as well as like different, different landing stations. So that was one that really connected, I guess, me and, me and Q to our homelands. Uh, and currently this version of the sculpture is on display at Epic Gallery online. And uh, there's a dialogue that accompanies it, which is a conversation between Hina Upuhala Ko'a, who I mentioned earlier, goddess of coral reefs, Azu, who's a Chinese sea goddess, and uh, the and Og, <laughs> the uh, Asian American gateway, kind of the cable deity, 
And it's also on view at Gray Area Festival's exhibition diorama, um, along with a video that's just meant to really show the, the conversation as it happens. It's about a 10 minute conversation. And they're talking about the history of technology over the past 1000 years and kind of what they've, how they've seen it grow and evolve and what it kind of means to each, each deity and how they relate to each other. These, you know, very old deities uh, who are over a thousand years old and this fairly new deity who is, who's grown out of this technology. So if you have a chance, um, the exhibition is, is incredible. I mean, there's, uh, I think like 10 different exhibition rooms. So ours is one of them within the space uh, and it's free to view online. And just as kind of a last uh, wrapping up of things, I wanted to show you uh, the street, I, one of the streets I grew up on, which is in Palola Valley on Oahu and, and how the water pipes just run kind of from the watersheds down to the cities. Uh, but this was kind of my backyard. And uh, then the next project I'm making is thinking about uh, the, the liminal spaces that exist within the rainforest and how, again, within Kanaka spirituality, we, we really see ourselves as connected to, not just connected to, but in ex our bodies as extensions of the land, being ancestors of uh, the land as our ancestor. Um, so, um, in some initial visualizations. Uh, this is photographs that I worked with Jason Chu of Lise and Sean, who are brother and sister, kind of emulating different ways of exploring kind of the, also the borders of the rainforest there, you know, as, as a place that holds um, a, lot of, a lot of power. Um, there are places in which you shouldn't really pass that, are, that aren't visible, but we're thinking about how to visualize these. Um, so this is a next exploration I'm going to Hawaii in November to work on a film. So we'll see what comes out of there. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, again, an honor to be here. I'm gonna stop screen sharing. How do I do that? <laughs> up top, up top, there's a little red, the red button should stop share. Yes. There, there you we go. go. <laughs> nice work. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really um, incredible to see all of that work in one blast. I really loved it. And and sorry, I butchered um, your gallery's name. No worries. Really it, I was like, oh my God, this is so crazy when you said that. Um, but this was this was really great to see the, the work together. Um, and I just do want to encourage everybody to go on your website and look at the um, the entirety of the, the first film you showed. Um, and just, I want to use that film as a starting point, just ask you a quick question, because the, the thing that's so interesting about your work is the way that you do involve ritual in almost all of it, you know, even to the, even, even down to the bioplastics workshops that I've, I've been part of that you've taught, which are really quite incredible. So I just wonder if you can speak about um, why that is um, so per, not just pervasive in your work, but, but really moves us to understand the work a, at a whole nother level. I mean, you can see it from people's comments in the chat, et cetera. People are really quite moved by that aspect of your work across all the different projects. Sorry, I was reading the comments because I didn't get to see them <laughs> earlier. So could you just tell me the beginning of the question again? Um, I was just, I was just, I was referring back to the your the first film you showed and oh yes, and the kind of ritual that was in that, you know, alongside of the science of using electrophoresis and all of these other things, but there's all of this great kind mm -hmm. of, as you said, well, this isn't really a, a standard lab, but it is, it is a kind of lab. And so what what is all of that ritual ritualization um you know bring bring to that discussion i guess for you because it's i mean i could say a lot but i would love to hear it from your end yeah absolutely so having having worked as a lab tech you know the laboratory there is a lot of monotonous tasks that you have to do as those of you know who've worked in a lab it's just like you're filtering something the same thing like all the different you know you have a hundred samples of something and you have to check you know different measurements on it a hundred times so uh it was it almost felt ritualistic in a way um but there's no sense of really reverence or kind of connect like this this connectedness to the thing that you're 
kind of just, you know, pulling apart um, and, and measuring. For me, I mean, when I was working with the, with the algae, the microalgae in Kona, I mean, I was, I was in awe, especially after, you know, um, I, I remember I always feeling a sense of awe looking into a microscope and seeing kind of this universe that exists. Um, but after a while, you lose that, I think, when you work in a lab. So I was kind of trying to bring back that initial sense of awe and what could different sort of speculative ritual, ceremonial type, um, you know, uh, ex performative kind of, ex you know, things be that, that related to other species. What, you know, if, if there was like a worship of cyanobacteria as, as our progenitor, so to speak, what would that look like, <laughs> you know? So it's really playing with these ideas. Um, and I think it's meant for viewers to take different things from, from, from them, you know, it's not trying to be explicit in terms of what's happening and it's meant to really intrigue and, and provoke as my work does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And it, and, and it also brings back into the discussion, no matter what you are talking about in the work, this, um, uh, you know, human and non-human elements together. So it makes that really um, visible in some way. And then, and then these other deities and things that you're bringing in. So it's, it's really great, really great. Thank you. Um, does anybody in the, in the, the uh, virtual audience have a quick question and then we'll take a break before we go for this group discussion. Anybody want to jump in or we just, should we hold it for the group discussion? Brandy, yeah. I just um, am wondering if you could talk uh, about that, that idea of the medium of working with uh, living material being an extension of your own body and how that guides you. Mm. Yeah. So specifically for the, the bioplastics, for instance, or I mean, even more for the last piece, but all, uh, really oh. all the pieces, if you, I mean, you know, the, the, the fact that Mother Earth is part of your body, your ancestor, mm -hmm. your extension. How does that shift on a, a spiritual and uh, kind of ethical level, your relation with your material that you work with? Yeah, um, I think growing up with this kind of worldview for Hawaiians, there's a, a pantheon of deities that are connected to the elements that are connected to, like we have like a hundred different types of deities for the wind or in the clouds, or sorry, the clouds, um, some like that. So it's like growing up around stories that kind of uh, talk about the different entanglements of these deities, whether they're romantic or like familial lines, you kind of see the interconnectedness of uh, you know, the different hydrological system <laughs> told through stories um, of, of deities that could be related to, like, that could be Amakua, which are, which are like family ancestral gods. Um, and I don't, there's just a sense of interconnectedness of everything, as well as everything being alive all around you. And kind of you saw the, the street I grew up on, it's just like, you know, the the rainforest is encroaching at all times. So I think this sense of aliveness, the sense of interconnectedness, I, I always kind of think about it and, it and it comes into my work. And then I think with the sense of everything is alive, um, when I'm creating something like bioplastic, even though it's like, a, you know, a dead, like a considered dead substance, if it's just like a powder of, of a dried algae, <laughs> you know, that's ground up, um, there's still, you know, a, a aliveness to it, or it's somewhere kind of in the middle. And so again, there's more care that's put into the, the creation of the work. And I just, I, I think it pushes me to do everything with a lot of care and intention. Um, so, and I think that kind of energetic transfer that you put into anything you're creating that gets seen or viewed that whoever is seeing or viewing it also has that transfer of, I would hope, you know, it's kind of like when you're, you're tasting a meal when, you, you know, you can tell when the cook has really put a lot of care into the, into the food they're cooking. And I think it shouldn't be any different with, with art making, with, 
with filmmaking, with, with any, you know, anything that we're doing, um, because there, it will be consumed in a way um, by others. So, um, oh, bye White Feather. Thank you for being here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's kind of inherent. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you.